Well, good morning, everyone. Appreciate all of you coming and being here this morning. Um, one of the things that uh, we're trying to do is make sure that we're having uh, some of these events uh, throughout the summer and the spring that are gonna be focused on ways that you can be conserving water in the landscape. Uh, this is uh, an important initiative for the city of Edmond, uh, and uh, it's good that you're here, and I'm glad that you're interested in, uh, in water conservation. So rain, rainwater harvesting is one of those topics that maybe you don't immediately think about when you start thinking about ways that I can save water, uh, unless you're doing it on a really large scale. Uh, but rainwater harvesting is a, a, a pretty straightforward and simple way that you can uh, sort of dip your toe into some water conservation um, activities. And it is a very hands-on way of um, feeling like you can um, make a difference in how you're applying water to your landscape. Uh, so that's what we're going to talk about today. And uh, I'm also going to touch just really briefly on, on rain gardens because that is a kind of related uh, but, but slightly different topic. And some of you may have some interest in other ways that you can work in your landscape in a way that helps to um, take water that's, that's, that's falling on the ground and use it more effectively. Uh, try to have less of it running uh, down the gutters and, and things like that and getting more of it back. Uh, into the groundwater, uh, which is one of the things that we're interested in trying to accomplish. So, I know all of you uh, are really excited about going back to school and uh, taking some quizzes. So we're going to start with a quiz or two. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I wanted to introduce the, the Think Water group. So, um, Oklahoma State University in the uh, Horticulture and Landscape Architecture program, uh, we have a program called Think Water. Uh, this is one of our extension programs that's focused on outdoor water conservation. Uh, so we partner with a number of different municipalities in the state. Uh, currently we've done a lot of work with the city of Oklahoma City and with the city of Edmond. Uh, and we also work with the uh, Oklahoma Water Resources Board. Uh, but the goal is just to help educate Oklahomans about how to use water resources in a way that's sustainable. Uh, and this is often dealing with how we're using our water out, outside. So this is how do we irrigate uh, the landscape? Uh, how do we choose plants that are going to be um, you know, well adapted to Oklahoma's environment that are uh, not gonna require uh, excessive amounts of water during the summertime and, and these types of things. So this is uh, some of the topics that we're trying to focus on. And this is the kind of programming that we're bringing uh, to the Edmond community. Okay, so let's start with a few quizzes for you guys. So typical water consumption in the city of Edmond during the winter is about 8 million gallons per day. So that seems like a lot of water, but we have a lot of residents, right? Uh, so how high do you think it can get during the summer? Does anybody have a guess? 16 million. 16 million. So it doubles, doubles in the summer, okay? Triple. You think triple? Mm -hmm. Okay. So 16, 24. 32, hut, hut, hut. <laughs> so in the summer, we had a good, a good guess on about three times more. In the summer, water consumption can peak uh, at up to 26 million gallons per day. So that is a really big increase. And think about anything else that you're trying to budget or manage in your life. Uh, if your expenses uh, for your home were to triple uh, during certain times of the year, you'd have to really plan for that, right? You, you wouldn't be able to just automatically say, oh, well, my grocery budget normally is, is uh, $400, but uh, for three months out of the year, it's gonna be $1,200. Uh, it'll be fine, I'll just deal with that whenever the summer gets here. You, you'd have to be trying to plan around that. And so that's one of the things that the city of Edmond's trying to, to make sure that they're focused on is can we uh, deliver the water that we need for the community throughout the whole year. Okay, so let's, let's talk about your sort of average personal use for someone in Oklahoma. So what do you think? How much water does a person, an average person, use each day in Oklahoma? And this will just be an average throughout the year. So we got one for B, 80 gallons. What do you think? I see a head shake. Not thinking that's it. Higher or lower? Sir, I'm going to go with 80. <laughs> going for 80. Okay, we've got 80 and 80. You think it's higher or lower? Higher? This is like uh, that game show on The Price is Right, right? <laughs> 
Okay, so 185 gallons per day. So this is based on some 2010 data. And that's probably important because this combines indoor and outdoor water use, okay? So in, in 2010, you know, climate changes throughout uh, year to year as far as how much water we're receiving, how much water we're applying to our landscapes and these types of things. But if we look uh, on average with that 2010 data, about 185 gallons per person per day. So that's, you know, quite a bit of water. And if you look, if you look around the United States, you'll see um, this is within, you know, the range that you would see, but in areas where they uh, are really focused on trying to reduce water consumption, you'll see these numbers can be brought down considerably uh, by some uh, very focused, intentional efforts to look at how we're utilizing uh, our water. And that can be brought down, you know, even below 100 gallons per day. Uh, you look at, uh, at other parts of the world, though, there are people that are uh, getting by on, on maybe, you know, five gallons a day. So uh, the amount of water we need just to sustain life is, is uh, you know, a couple of liters a day. You have to be drinking that much water just to survive. Uh, but you start thinking about washing clothes, preparing food, uh, showering, these kinds of things. That, that water consumption definitely goes up. And then as you add things like uh, having a vegetable garden, trying to grow turf grass in your front yard, all these types of things that also dries up our water usage. Okay, so what percentage of water that we use outdoors is wasted whenever we are watering the landscape? 75. 75%. percent we're, we're shooting high. You felt like you got burned on the last one. <laughs> we're shooting a little higher. 100% seems unreasonable, right? We're not wasting at all. What do you think? 50, hedging or bets. All right, so as much as 50% of the water that we apply, good job, kudos for you. As much as 50% of the water that we apply to the landscape is wasted. So how are some ways that you think water can be wasted when it's being applied to the landscape? Water in the middle of the, in the, middle of the hot afternoon. Okay, so what happens when I water in the middle of a hot afternoon? just evaporates, right? So before it can really soak into the soil, I'm, I'm evaporating, losing some water due to evaporation. What are other things maybe you see? The wind. The wind, okay. So the wind in Oklahoma can blow uh, water that we're trying to apply to our yard, let's say, off target. So that's, that's definitely an issue in Oklahoma. If you leave your uh, sprinkler system on automatic and if you're watering your lawn, on one of those rare days it rains in Oklahoma. That's right. So if I'm running my irrigation system sort of on autopilot, I'm not thinking about it, I've, I've got it turned on, um, and I don't have any sensors in place that will allow it to automatically shut off whenever we are having a rain event, uh, then I can have uh, irrigation that's happening on the lawn while it's actually raining. You probably see that sometimes when you drive around town. I, there's a McDonald's that I drive by that every time it's raining, their irrigation system is, is still going. Uh, you know, that, it's not just a McDonald's problem, but that's just one of the ones that I ha happen to notice. I see a lot of uh, people in neighborhoods uh, that have that, uh, that challenge with not having their irrigation system adjust for uh, things like the amount of precipitation we have. Now, the other thing on the other side of that is, uh, like the environment we're in right now, we've had a lot of rain. We have good soil moisture right now. Uh, so I really don't need to be irrigating my lawn yet. Uh, but again, sometimes out of habit or routine, we will turn on our irrigation system and we're not um, looking at, do I need to be applying water right now or can I, can I wait to be applying that water? So uh, these are some topics uh, actually that we'll talk about throughout the spring and the summer at some of our workshops as well. Okay, so if I'm watering an average sized lawn 20 minutes a day for a week, the amount of water use that that is equivalent to. So let's uh, sort of put it in terms maybe we can relate to. We'll think about the shower. So is that equivalent to running a shower nonstop for four hours, running a shower nonstop for 24 hours, running a shower nonstop for two days, or running a shower nonstop for four days? Two days. Two days. This just gives everybody else an opportunity to come up with a curve. 
I, I appreciate your willingness to jump out there and put a stake in the ground. Very good. Anyone want to argue with them? This two days. We become a team, so I'm going to go with that too. You're going two days. Okay, we got the two day crew. No one thinks it's four hours. That's probably reasonable. Okay, so yeah, running the shower nonstop for four days. Okay, so that's about 12,000 gallons of water that I'm using. If I'm, at, if I'm watering an average sized lawn for 20 minutes a day, uh, every day for, for the week. Okay, so that's a lot of water, right? Um, and so these are the kinds of things when we're talking about our outdoor water usage that we're trying to be aware of. We're just trying to make ourselves think about how am I using water, where are places that I could cut down on my water usage, and um, what's the impact of that gonna, gonna look like? I operate on a four day work week, so that's why I'm a, a four day work week, that, that makes sense, okay. I appreciate that. Okay, um, the cost of water. So I'm, I'm trying to get into this sort of value proposition a little bit. So the cost of a gallon of water to a, a typical residential customer in, in uh, Edmond is closest to, so th these are in dollars, right? So that's a, a penny a gallon, five cents a gallon, 10 cents a gallon, 25 cents a gallon. What, what's, a, what's a bottle of Dasani cost? Like I go to the, I go to the gas station, I go to on cue and grab a bottle of water. Like two bucks, right? Okay. If I get the off-brand, like cheaper water, maybe it's a dollar twenty-nine or something like that. But okay. So what do you what do you think? Who who pays attention to their utility bill? <laughs> You're on a well. Okay. What do you think? You think a penny a gallon? What do you guys think? A nickel. Okay. Does anybody have a really good sense for what their utility rates are? Yeah, you sort of pay the water bill, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, it's actually closest to about a penny. Uh, it's actually a little bit less than a penny if, if we just sort of look at typical rates. So if you go out to the City of Edmond website, you can see what the rates are. There's a, there's a rate for the first thousand gallons that you use, and that's based on the size of the line that you have coming into your house. And it's a little bit different for a residential customer than it would be for a, uh, for a business within the community. Uh, but it's uh, about $11 for the first 1,000 gallons, then $6.68 uh, per 1,000 gallons up to 10,000. And then it changes. It gets a little bit more expensive after that. So when we go from uh, 10,000 to 20,000, the price goes up a little bit. When we get over 20,000, the price goes up a little bit more. That's a, that's a tiered pricing structure. Uh, so the goal there is to make us think a little bit more about how we're using water by making it a little bit more expensive as we use more of it. That's supposed to help with conservation. Um, and the other thing is we want to make sure that because everybody needs water to survive, that we can, can try to keep the cost of water at a reasonable level um, for what would be sort of normal usage that you'd expect to have just inside the house. So that's where we're balancing things when we're looking at a tiered pricing model. So when we talk about water though, these are some things maybe you remember learning in your uh, science class in the sixth grade or something like that. So the, the earth is mostly water. We are also mostly water, right? So the earth is about 70% uh, water as far as the, the covering of the surface of the earth. Um, but only about two and a half percent of this is fresh water. And fresh water is what we need to be able to drink and wash our clothes and these types of things. Out of this 2.5%, um, or out of the 70%, 2.5% of that is, is fresh water. 1% of our fresh water is, is surface water. That's you know, pretty easily accessible. That's where most of our uh, water that we use, that we treat and then utilize in our communities is from. About 30% is groundwater. And about 69% of that is tied up in glaciers and ice caps and these types of things. So the, uh, out of all the water that's covering the earth, we, we have only a little bit that is actually easily accessible to us, useful, and uh, so we want to make sure we take care of that little bit of water that we have, right? Because our, our budget is, is limited. Uh, and we can do things like desalinate water. So I can, I can take ocean water 
and I can pull the salt out of it and I can use that water but that's expensive. It takes a lot of energy to do that because I'm either passing it through a, a membrane separator where I have to apply a lot of pressure to push it through basically a big filter uh, or I have to do things like heat the water up and let it evaporate and then capture uh, that evaporated water. So that takes a lot of energy. That drives the cost of our water up quite a bit. But you do see this in areas where uh, water is really difficult to access. So California does desalinization. If you go into the Middle East, you see a lot of large desalinization plants there. There's also a byproduct of that, which is very concentrated saltwater solution. It's called brine. And so we have to also manage this as a waste product. And so it's, it's difficult to manage. You don't want to just go dump it you know, on the ground somewhere. You're going to kill everything where you're dumping the saltwater solution out. So you know, these things have consequences that come with them as well. OK, well, the thing I want you to walk away with is that water is precious. So even though we try to um, control the cost of water uh, within our, most of our municipalities and within the city of Edmond, uh, water is probably, the cost of water is probably lower than the value of water to us. I, I can't live without water for more than a couple of days. And so I, I need it. It's essential to life. And we use it for many things. Uh, we want to make sure that we place the value on it that it has, even though maybe it's not that expensive for me to turn on the tap and, and get water out that I can use. Okay. So... <laughs> This might look uh, sort of familiar. This is from uh, last year, actually, when we were having a, a large rain event in Oklahoma City. Um, and so we've seen more of this in the last few years, right? Uh, and so it's easy sometimes for us to forget that we need to be focused on um, water conservation and how we're utilizing our water and do that effectively. Uh, but it's, it's easy to get lazy when, when things look like, OK, we've got plenty of water. But we also uh, can remember just a few years ago when we were in some pretty severe drought, what Lake Hefner looked like. That, that's one that really stands out in my mind because when you, when you drive by the lake and you see all the water has retreated uh, away from the lighthouse, you have what, what looks like a dried up pond essentially for, uh, for Lake Hefner. Uh, the city of Oklahoma City is uh, you know they're they're pulling their water resources to try to treat the water and and deliver drinking water to their customers. Um, other communities are doing the same thing. So we start to get into this situation where people are very attenuated to uh, how am I using water? How can I conserve water? What's the future going to look like for my kids if we don't have water? If this if this becomes more uh, more common, uh, how are we going to take care of our communities? What's the future going to look like for my children? So people start thinking about those things. Uh, but then, you know, we, we have a few years like this, and it's like, oh, well, I'll, I'll deal with that later. Uh, but again, if we're thinking about, like, our household budget, um, whenever we have uh, a need for water or money for groceries or whatever the case might be, and we have these up and down uh, events that come, so maybe my paycheck changes some throughout the year uh, and I have to plan ahead, I have to put some money back. I, I need to think about water in the same way. How can I conserve it to make sure I have enough for the future? And this is uh, just an indication of what the, the climate's like in Oklahoma. We have periods of drought and we have periods that are wetter. Uh, and so this is a precipitation history of Oklahoma. We're starting back in the 1900s here, okay? And then, you know, this is like the 1930s. A lot of people focus on that dust, bowl, that dust bowl period. That was an extended dry period. But, you know, you also wind up with, with years where you have a wet year in the middle of a dry year. So you have this variability that comes. And that's part of the climate that we have within Oklahoma. We're in kind of a wet period right now. But another dry period is going to come again. And we'll have to be uh, making sure that we're continuing to have good practices in place that will carry us through periods of, of drought uh, that will also help us as our communities grow. Um, so the city of, city of Edmond, about how many residents are in the city of Edmond? Do you all have a good feel for that? About 100,000, yeah, that's a pretty good estimate. Um, the, uh, the last information that I got from the city of Edmond, I think it was maybe 93,000 was the, was the estimate. 
And that's, uh, you know, we haven't had the most recent census, so that's older data. What do you think it was 20 years ago? Yeah, it was around 60,000, right? So the city of Edmonds population has grown like 35% in the last 20 years. So the amount of uh, uh, infrastructure that has to be put in place to make sure that the city has enough, enough water and wastewater treatment and all these things have, have led to a lot of investments being required. And uh, you know, we already talked about uh, what our water conservation looks like at different times of the year. We've talked about this increase in, uh, in Edmonds population and the city's been investing a lot of money into, uh, into infrastructure uh, in water in particular is what I wanted to, to mention is you know, there's over $400 million in projects that are ongoing to uh, improve the infrastructure, put new wastewater treatment facilities in place, you know, new water towers, make sure we're uh, supplying water to the, to the whole community effectively. Uh, so this is you know, important uh, to the city to make sure that they can keep up with growth. And we want to make sure that investments that are made uh, within the infrastructure will continue to be sufficient 20 years from now as the population continues to grow so that Edmond continues to be a great place to live. So we want to start talking now about rainwater harvesting and why, we, why we're interested in that, uh, what are some of the advantages of it, and then we'll talk about some practical things. Uh, so what, is this, what does this look like? A store, right? So this is like, this is a Lowe's if I remember correctly. Okay, so I got on Google Earth. I, I took a snapshot of Lowe's. Um, what do you think this looked like before Lowe's was here? Green. Green, yeah, it was probably like a, a field. Maybe there were a few trees. It was pretty typical Oklahoma uh, landscape. Probably used to be uh, farmland at one time. But it's been converted into a, into a store and a large parking lot around it, right? So, um, you know, that, that's part of the trade-off that we have for, for urban development. What happens when it rains? Where does the water go? Yeah, it just runs off, right? So it's, it's not going to absorb into the asphalt. Uh, it's not going to absorb through the roof of the building. That, that water is storm water. It has to be directed in a way that we can try to keep uh, the street safe try to get it directed to the, to the creeks and the, and the streams and things like that that will take it away from the community. So there's challenges associated with this and anytime we have, um, anytime we have more development, we're sort of dealing with how do we deal with the storm water. When I have a storm event, I have, you can see this graph over here, okay? So this green line is what a storm flow would look like as far as the surge whenever I have a large rain event that occurs over time. So I have an undeveloped area. This is just uh, agricultural land or something like that. I have a storm event. There's some peak to my stream flows that are surrounding because I have to get all that water to move through the, through the system, through the floodplain that I have. Uh, but then it sort of goes back to, to normal levels. And that's a, a manage generally speaking, a manageable sort of a peak that I have in my stream flows. Uh, Whenever I have uh, development that occurs in a community, what I tend to get is a, a very peaky uh, sort of a storm flow that happens. So that water, it's not slowed down by flowing across a field. Um, it's, it's not uh, able to be absorbed into the asphalt parking lot, right? So it's not like as it's flowing, some of it's soaking into the surface of the soil and some of it's running off. Uh, so we have a much sharper peak uh, the, the runoff is uh, more intense and happens more quickly. And so we're dealing with uh, more opportunities for flooding, more pictures where the cars are stranded in the middle of the road sort of things, right? So stormwater management is, is an important aspect of um, why things like rainwater harvesting can be effective because they can capture some of that water instead of it uh, going out into the, the gutters and running down the street and stuff like that. I can capture some of that and use it later. So Again, it's like I'm putting some money in savings. I'm putting some water in savings so I can use it later when it's dry. Uh, it's also uh, free water for my plants, and uh, it doesn't have any of our chemicals that we, we use for our potable water to make sure that it stays safe. So it doesn't have chlorine and, and fluoride and things like that in it. And some plants are sensitive to that, and so um, some people really like to try to water 
uh, with uh, with rainwater just because they they like the way that their plants thrive whenever they use whenever they utilize that. So there are some advantages of that. And rainwater harvesting can take a lot of different shapes uh, and forms. This is a uh, 55 gallon rain barrel. So this is like if you came to the city of Edmonds rain barrel distribution event that happens in the, in the winter. I think this year it was uh, in February. And they do these sort of throughout this region. Uh, you would have picked up a barrel like this. This is like a, a recycled um, olive barrel or pickle barrel or something like that. So there's a, a company that the city works with called Upcycle. Uh, and so upcycleproducts.com is the name of the company and they work with uh, Stillwater and they work with Oklahoma City and things like that as well. But they take these uh, food grade barrels, they clean them out, they uh, apply some of the proper fittings and things like that that you need to have and they make these rain barrels available to communities. So if I was buying one through the city of Edmond, I think they're like $65 or something like that and I can put a rain barrel in place pretty easily uh, that I can utilize. Now some people We'll start with something like that and that'll be sufficient for them. Other people get really into rainwater harvesting and they're like, you know, 55 gallons is nice, but I'd really rather have like 500 gallons of storage capacity, okay? They wanna really capture a lot of water. So they'll start looking at other options that they can utilize. So this one in the, in the middle, uh, this is, uh, this is a homeowner that uh, utilized what's called some IBC totes. Okay, so this is an intermediate bulk container, IBC, is, that's what that stands for. And so these things are about this big, right? It's like a big air conditioning unit, essentially. And they come in slightly different sizes. Um, typical, though, is about 275 gallons. So you can see I've got a lot more capacity in one of those. They're also um, often used for food grade commodities and things like that. Some of them are used for, uh, for other chemicals, though. So generally speaking, if you're going to get uh, an IBC container, you can get these, um, you know, used sort of uh, containers, just like sometimes you see people selling 55 gallon drums on the side of the road. You, you can also pick up surplus IBC containers, uh, but you do want to make sure that it's coming from like a food grade source, so you don't have to worry about any chemicals that might have been in it. But they'll convert those uh, for rainwater capture as well. And so you can see this is a little bit more involved system here, right? They've got, uh, they've got large PVC piping that's connected to the gutters on their house. They've got connections in between all their different containers so they can uh, all be filled together. And so this is maybe, you know, a, a more serious homeowner that's really getting after it. And then on a, on a community scale, uh, here in Edmond at uh, Bickham Rudkin Park, we have a 2200 gallon rainwater collection system. And uh, so this is behind a fence now, but this is when uh, the project was being put in place. So these are large uh, 1100 gallon each, um, uh, you know, plastic containers that can collect and store that rainwater until it's gonna be used later. And then this is used, this is where the, there's a Zurich uh, garden that's out there. So there's a low water use garden that's at that park. and. Uh, this rainwater can be collected and used for uh, watering that facility. So there's a lot of different options and a lot of different sizes that someone can look at if they're trying to establish rainwater harvesting in their yard. We're going to kind of focus on, you know, more introductory if I have a 55 gallon drum or I have a couple of those that I wanted to connect together. But know that there are people that, that get more serious about really expanding their capacity. And there's a lot of great resources out on the internet uh, that, that you can investigate and look into some of these things as well. One thing I will tell you though, if you decide you wanna go this IBC route, so you're looking at this maybe 250, 300 gallon uh, container that you're gonna capture rainwater in, those are typically clear. Uh, if I have water in a clear container in the sun, what's gonna happen? Algae, Algae right? So it's important that you paint them or cover them. These are, these are covered in a black tarp, okay? So we're trying to keep the light out so that the algae won't grow. And that is something that you have to watch and monitor and periodically do some cleaning and things like that. Um, but definitely you'll see some people that have failures with uh, trying to just sort of put together a rain barrel collection system uh, if they don't look out for things like uh, avoiding algae growth. The other problem you can have uh, with water. If you're collecting water somewhere in your yard, what's the other thing that you might be concerned about? Yeah. 
mosquitoes, right? So we want to make sure we're managing mosquitoes. I don't want to just have open pools of water. I'm going to become a nuisance to my, uh, to my neighbors. Uh, I'm not going to be able to go out in my yard, right? So there's going to be challenges associated with that. So those are two big things I want to make sure that I'm thinking about is uh, avoiding uh, a source of standing water for, uh, for mosquitoes. Okay, so if I'm looking at a rainwater harvest system, I'm going to have essentially five different things to address, okay? I'm going to have uh, some catchment, so I've got to catch the water somehow. I'm going to have conveyance, I've got to move the water from one location to another. I'm going to have storage, that's the part we think about. I'm going to have some overflow, so what happens when that container fills up? I need to make sure I'm managing the overflow of that container when it gets full. And then I'm going to have some outlet. At some point, I want to be able to pull that water out and use it uh, to water my plants and those types of things. Uh, so this is a, a larger, more complex system, but it's sort of outlining all of the different components. And I, I don't want to spend a lot of time walking through that. I've got, um, I've got a fact sheet here that I'll give you guys before you leave. It actually has this image in it as well, so you can look at that in a little bit more detail. But this is essentially, this is essentially pointing out, you know, I have a catchment system, which in this case is the roof of my house. I have a conveyance system, which is the gutters that I have on my house that are connected to my storage. So this is a large storage tank in this case. And because it's a large storage tank, it has some other uh, piping and things like that to manage that water effectively. Uh, but essentially, it's, it's, a large, you know, it's a larger version of a 55-gallon drum. Uh, I do have some overflow allowance, so in this case, uh, when it fills up, there's, a, there's an overflow that's going to direct it to, you know, a, a French drain or to uh, wh wherever the local, uh, my nearby stream is going to be or something like that. It's got to go into the watershed again after it leaves this. But I don't want it to, like, erode the foundation of my house, right? So I want to make sure I'm controlling that overflow process that might happen. And then uh, a larger system like this, uh, often someone will use um, a pump in order to pressurize that water flow and be able to pump it out of that tank. Usually when we're dealing with a smaller system, we're just like filling up a container so we can go and water uh, some plants by hand. And that's one of the big differences in the scale of the system is uh, when I go to a large scale system like this, I'm generally thinking about, okay, now I need to have some way of effectively using this water. If I've got 2,000 gallons of water at the park, I'm going to probably need to pump that, pressurize it, be able to use it in a drip irrigation system or something uh, so that I can utilize that water effectively. Okay, so catchment, I'm, I'm looking at uh, the roof of my home or a building, maybe a workshop, something like that. Uh, I want to think about how much water I'm going to capture uh, whenever a rain event happens. And so if I'm looking at the area uh, of a home, now calculating the the uh, surface area of this roof would get a little bit complicated, right? It has all these peaks and valleys and things like that, but I really don't need to worry about that. I can just look at the, uh, the footprint of this roof line. So if I was trying to figure out about what the footprint of this roof was, that'll allow me to calculate the area that water's falling on. So I can sort of ignore the slope. So essentially, it's the square footage of my home, right? If, if I'm thinking about how big is my catchment area? Well, it's about the square footage of my home. Now my garage is a part of that too, so I might have to include that in my estimate. Um, and then I'm looking at, maybe I'm only harvesting uh, rainwater from a corner of the house. So my house has four downspouts. I'm going to harvest rainwater off of one of those downspouts. So my area then is only a quarter of what my overall uh, home area is. So I'm going to want to estimate how much of that rainfall that, that happens is coming into this particular downspout uh, that I have on my house. And then if I really want to figure out how many gallons uh, that I can capture, and that's going to help me with some sizing, uh, I can say, okay, my, my gallons of water is going to be equal to uh, the inches of precipitation that I have. So we get a, an inch of rain that happens uh, times my area, okay, so that area, say I have a 2,000 square foot home, uh, it's got four downspouts, I'm capturing the water off of a quarter of that, so that's 500 square feet, right? So I've got 500 square feet of surface area, I have a one inch rain event, okay? And then 0.6 is just a conversion factor, so that just gets, 
all the units between inches and feet and gallons to work out properly. So if I have a one inch uh, rain event and I have uh, a 500 square foot, I'm, I'm gonna get my calculator here on my phone, maybe. Who can do math in their head? Okay, so 500 times an inch times 0.6. That's 300. 300 gallons of water that I can collect from a one inch rain event in my house. So I'm gonna fill up that 55 gallon drum pretty quick, right, if I, have a, if I have a big rain event. But that gives you an indication of how much water can be collected. Now if I lived in Arizona, I might really be concerned about trying to capture and store as much of that water as possible. Um, but this is uh, letting me know how big my system could be. A one inch rain event, if in most of Oklahoma, that's like a 90 percentile event. So if I look at all the different rain that we have, uh, a one inch rain is sort of in the 90th percentile. So we, we think about those big rain events that happen, but sometimes we get smaller, you know, a tenth or a quarter of an inch or something like that. Okay, conveyance. I'm gonna use my gutters to, to take that collected water and put it into my storage. Uh, so generally speaking, I'm just using my gutters to collect that water and direct it to my rain barrel. So there's sort of two common things that you'll see in smaller uh, storage. One would be an open top. So uh, the top of the barrel essentially is, is open. The water just flows from the gutter right into the rain barrel. So if I get one of the rain barrels from the city, that's typically the design that they have. Um, but you can also have a seal top. And uh, so the seal top, one of the advantages of that is it does make it a little bit easier to deal with things like insects. So I'm, I'm less likely to have a mosquito problem if I have a sealed container. Uh, and I can utilize uh, a diverter. Uh, so this has a diverter uh, attachment to the gutter here so that whenever my rain barrel fills up, it just overflows into the gutter like it, like it did before. So I don't have to worry as much about what am I gonna do with this water whenever the rain barrel's full. So this open top here, you can't really see it, but that, that top is a, is a mesh. So it's a fine uh, screen material. So just like a door screen you would have, it's, it's a very fine material to keep the mosquitoes out. And so that's applied to the top. You need to make sure that that's being maintained in good condition so that insects and mosquitoes and things like that don't get inside your rain barrel. Uh, but you can see uh, whenever this thing's full, there's gonna be a high likelihood that it's just gonna overflow the top of that barrel and run everywhere, right? So that is one of the challenges of the, of the open top sort of a system is um, my, my ability to manage the water in a heavy downpour is not quite as good. Uh, but with a seal top, there's some advantages to that. And you can see this is, this is a, a converted barrel that somebody had. So uh, this is just a, you know, industrial 55 gallon drum uh, that someone uh, picked up and, um, and applied some of the proper fittings and things to so that they could use it as a rain barrel. Uh, when we're thinking about downspout modifications, if I'm, if I'm utilizing an open top, uh, often I'm just trimming a portion of my downspout away so that I can run that water into the top of the rain barrel. So uh, this is sort of two different options. On, on one they used all metal elbows. Uh, so they attached uh, one elbow here and then another elbow turning the other direction and that's just feeding water into the top of that rain barrel. And this one they used like a, a flexible tubing uh, but it's accomplishing the same purpose. It's just moving the water from the gutter into the top of the rain barrel. If I was using one of these uh, diverter valves, then I have to drill uh, a hole in the side of my gutter. So uh, some of the kits will come with a little hole saw that you can use uh, to, to cut out a hole there. And then it has, there's different, different suppliers and slightly different designs, but there's some sort of a device that would slip inside of the gutter. And then whenever, um, whenever it's raining and my barrel is empty, I'm able to uh, have water flowing into the outside region and it's directing it into this tube and into my rain barrel. But when the rain barrel gets full, then water can't flow out this tube anymore because it's being met by, that, by the water in the barrel. And so it just overflows through the middle. And then it just goes right out the, right out the gutter like it did before. 
So I like these diverters. I think they make it very easy for you to manage how the rainwater is being handled and what happens whenever your, uh, whenever your rain barrel is filled. Yes, ma'am? During some of our gully washers, mm -hmm. are those ever overwhelmed to the point where it actually backs up into the downspout, into the gutter? Or this, this, should be, this should be sized fine to be able to handle that. Okay. The only thing that you can run into uh, is if you get debris. Uh, so you do want to you do want to look at um, you know, there's there's ways that you can filter in your gutter so that you can screen that and make sure you don't get leaves and, and stuff that come into your uh, into your downspout because clearly if you get a bunch of leaves and debris mm -hmm. on top of this it's going to clog up yeah. so that that would be the kind of challenge you'd run into yes sir. Uh, Lowe's, I, or Home Depot, I know, sells uh, these diverters. I expect Lowe's also has them. You can also get them online. If you search for a rain barrel diverter, there will be several different types that, that pop up. Um, but uh, this particular model, uh, they sell at Home Depot. Okay, as far as storage, again, there's lots of options on the small scale that you can look at. Uh, there are often City programs uh, that distribute rain barrels like the ones that we have here in Edmond. Uh, you can buy some other kind of a, of a barrel. And again, I would encourage food grade uh, sort of barrels that you're looking at. And you can buy kits. Uh, you can buy kits online for making those modifications to the barrel. And it'll have the, you know, the valve that you need to put in the bottom. And it'll have a, a fill tube and those kinds of things. So you can have all that together in one kit. And then there are uh, more involved uh, more aesthetically pleasing. Uh, there, there are some rain barrels that um, you, you wouldn't even know that it was that it was storing anything the way that they're that they're designed. So there's a lot of options out there depending on how much money you want to spend. But you know, a rain barrel like this might be three or four hundred dollars. And this is a little bit more capacity than what you have here. Maybe this is like a hundred gallon capacity. But you have to you know, decide what are the trade-offs that I'm willing to have for cost versus aesthetics and those types of things. And people do some pretty creative things even with these blue rain barrels in painting them or putting plants around them to try to hide it a little bit. So there's, there's options there. One other thing in uh, storage, again, you can go to larger systems. Uh, you're probably going to have to start thinking about bringing someone in to make sure you're doing things properly if you go to a large system like this because you're going to have to worry about foundation. Uh, you need to have a good solid foundation because you're going to have a lot of weight uh, that's in that rain barrel. Uh, and you also have more complex designs on how you're putting water into the rain barrel and taking it back out again. And as I mentioned before, you're probably looking at a pump at that point to distribute the water. Do be careful though, you want to elevate your rain barrel uh, just to make it easy enough to, to get a, uh, you know, a bucket underneath the outlet so that you can take that uh, rain water and go water your plants with it. Uh, but remember that a gallon of water weighs about eight pounds. And so if I have 50 gallons of water, I have quite a bit of weight there. If that's full of water and I have it on kind of a rickety structure, if that falls over, it could hurt me, it could hurt someone else. I wanna make sure that I'm, I'm careful about that. The foundation that I'm setting it on needs to be stable, needs to be flat, okay? So make sure you're watching that. A lot of people will use uh, cinder blocks and that's, and that's fine. You can use cinder blocks. There are companies that also will sell little stands that are either made out of wood or stone. Um, this one I like. Uh, this is similar to what I've seen some people do with their old uh, trash can uh, holders where they would have um, you know, a little stand for it to sit on and I like this railing around the edge. Sometimes I'll see people put these up on a, on a structure like this that maybe sits a couple, two or three feet off the ground, but they won't have any sort of uh, support rails on the edge. And to me, again, that's a, a danger of tipping. If I, have, if I have someone in the backyard, I wanna make sure that I'm, I'm keeping my area around my house as safe as possible. So you do want to make sure you're addressing those issues. Okay, if I'm trying to expand my system, uh, there are fairly straightforward ways of doing that if I have, um, if I have these 55 gallon uh, barrel sort of containers. And generally you're either looking at uh, a, a fill connection at the top or at the bottom. Now if I'm, if I'm connecting at the top like I have here, 
then as one fills, it'll overflow into the adjacent tank and it'll fill that one up next. The other option would be having a connection at the bottom and then they'll all fill up sort of simultaneously from the bottom that way. So some people have a preference for one over the other. Um, there are uh, there are standard little kits. You, you've, got a, you've got a hose here that looks like uh, that's off of a rain barrel kit that, you, that you've purchased. And so essentially there's a, a nipple that you would install into the top of your rain barrel. You'd screw the end of the hose on one end, end of the hose onto the other end of the, of the adjacent rain barrel, and then the water would flow from one to the next. Um, if you're using a bottom fill system, one of the things you have to be aware of is if you get a leak, you're going to drain all the water out of all your rain barrels. So that is one disadvantage of that system. You can put a check valve in there, a one-way valve, so the water will only flow in one direction. Uh, so there are ways that you can get around that. But be careful that you watch your connections. Of course, it's not the end of the world if water leaks on the ground, right? But it would be a little disappointing if you went through all that effort to collect rainwater and then it was gone because you had a leak. Okay, we talk about overflow. As I mentioned before, you need to make sure that you're considering what's going to happen when the rain barrel fills up. So we want to avoid this. This uh, rain barrel is a little bit blurry, but you can see that this rain barrel is overflowing all over the top. Now it has an overflow hose. That's what this, that's what this hose is supposed to do here on the end. So it's got uh, a nipple on the top that you can screw a hose into and that'll flow out of the barrel. Now if water's coming in fast, that hose is not going to provide enough capacity to be able to handle as much water as, as is coming out of this downspout, right? So that's why it's overflowing all over the place. So you need to make sure that the size of your overflow will handle the amount of water volume that you have coming into the, into the uh, barrel. So this system on the, on the left, well, my left, your, your right here, this one has a much larger overflow tube that you can see. So it's essentially the same size, if not bigger, than the downspout coming off the gutter. So as long as the gutter can handle the capacity, the downspout can handle the capacity, the overflow tube is going to be able to handle it as well. And you can see they also looked at trying to make sure that they were directing the water away from the foundation so that they didn't have you know, erosion of their foundation of their home from all this water that's dumping out the, the top of the bucket here. So those are things that you want to consider as you're looking at the overflow system. As I mentioned before, if you use a diverter, that can help make that process a little bit more simple in that you're utilizing your existing guttering uh, for your overflow of your, of your barrel. There are a lot of different commercial products out there. Some of them have integrated uh, filtration in them, so that is something you can consider if you're concerned about leaf fall or those types of things. This uh, Fiskars Diverter Pro, it has a actual little leaf filter within it that you can clean out periodically. So there's a number of different products uh, that you can consider when you're looking at putting a diverter in place. The outlet's usually fairly simple. I have essentially uh, a faucet like I would have on the outside of my house, but it just allows me to drain the water out of the rain barrel. I'll collect that in a bucket and I'll go use that to water my plants. Um, Sometimes people will try to have a pressurized system just with gravity. So they're thinking, well, there's some, uh, there's some force of the water. If I lift it up high enough, I'll be able to get enough pressure to use a garden hose or something like that. You get about 0.4 pounds per square inch, about 0.4 PSI for every foot of elevation that you have. So if I'm going to get very much pressure, uh, I'm going to have to put that up really high. So generally speaking, if I want to have a pressurized system, I need to use a pump of some sort. So most of the time, when we have smaller storage like this, we just are going to empty it out into a bucket and use that to hand water. Um, but if you're going to try to use uh, some sort of a pressurized system, there are some, some pumps uh, that you can put into your system. Again, it gets a little bit more complicated at that point. But if you're going to a larger storage uh, tank, then you're going to want to consider that anyway. Okay, so another option for looking at using the rain that falls is called a rain garden. A rain garden is essentially just a, a shallow depression that we have in the landscape. 
and uh, the water is going to collect there and be stored temporarily until it can soak into the ground, right? So it's, it's not unlike a retention pond that the city might have to deal with a large stormwater event, except you put a small one in your yard. And uh, so you are handling some of that stormwater, and instead of it just running down into the street, you're capturing it in your yard, you're using it to water some plants that you have in that area, and it's uh, gonna find its way into the, uh, into the soil profile, which is what we want it to do. And so we need to utilize native plants that are going to be uh, able to handle these sort of dry, wet cycles that you might have uh, in this kind of a garden. And ideally, whenever I put this in place, it's something that once it's established, I'm not having to provide any supplemental water to this uh, system. So it can handle uh, dry periods that we get within Oklahoma. Uh, but this is kind of what we want in a system. You know, during the storm, it's completely filled with water. You can't even tell there's any plants in this particular one. This is a, a, newer, uh, a newer installation. But 24 hours later, that water has seeped into the soil uh, there's actually some treatment uh, of the water as well. So, you know, normally when you have a runoff event coming off of a parking lot or something like that, you have a lot of oils and, and stuff from your car. There's a lot of pollutants in that water. There, there's some natural filtration that takes place as it moves through the soil profile. So that water is getting a little bit of treatment as well before it finds its way to the watershed. Uh -huh. We do. We have a fact sheet, and I'll mention that uh, at the end of this. We have a, a fact sheet specifically looking at plants that would be good for using within a rain garden. And so these are just some examples of some you know, attractive rain gardens that uh, people have put in place. And they can vary in size quite a bit. Um, but you can see you can use a lot of creativity. You can get a lot of really attractive plants. But typically you have you know, just a shallow berm that's on the, on the side of that uh, rain garden. And you're gonna have plants that are more tolerant of the uh, dry conditions at the, at the top, because they're gonna drain first. And then things that are able to handle higher levels of moisture in the bottom of that uh, rain garden, because they're gonna be getting uh, more water for longer periods of time. And again, we, we do have a fact sheet that'll walk through that. Whenever I'm picking a location to put a rain garden in place, I do want to consider some things. Uh, I want to keep it at least 10 feet away from the foundation of a building. So again, I don't want to flood my house whenever I put a rain garden in place, and it's going to have a concentration of water there. I want it to be at least 30 feet down slope from a building. So if I have a, my house or workshop or something like that, and I have the normal grade uh, where, the, where the water would flow across the top of the yard, I want to have that 30 feet away from any buildings that are going to be downslope from where it's from where it's located. Um, I want to have it at least two feet above a high water table. So if I have a really high water table on my property, it's probably not a good option for me. I want to avoid locations where my septic system is going to be located. Uh, my septic system is not going to percolate properly if I'm putting water on it all the time. And I also clearly want to avoid utilities. So anytime you're digging in your backyard, you want to make sure you're getting utilities marked so that you don't have problems with damaging any of your utilities. And then this is something maybe you don't think about right away. You say, oh, I've got this spot in my yard that the water always ponds up whenever it rains. I'll put a rain garden there. That's an indication that that's a part of your yard that doesn't drain very well. So that's probably not where you want to put the rain garden because you do want that water to, to be held there but then find its way into the soil. And areas that naturally pond water probably have a high clay content and they're not letting the water flow through it very effectively. So you might just end up uh, uh, designing a, a nice um, mosquito pond in your backyard if you're, if you're not careful. So avoid areas where there's a lot of natural ponding that occurs. And you do want to uh, do soil testing before you would select a site to make sure that you have a good soil that's going to uh, percolate the water at, a, at an acceptable rate and you'll even want to do some testing. Um, so, and again, we have, a, we have a fact sheet that talks about this. Uh, but you're going to want to do some testing to see uh, how quickly is the water draining. Essentially, I'm digging a hole in the, in the ground. I'm adding water to it. And I'm seeing how long it takes for that water to drain out of that hole. And then I can say, OK, I've got at least a quarter inch per hour of drainage. 
And my goal is for that water that's in my pond to drain within, within 24 hours. So if, if that water's gonna be gone within 24 hours, I don't have to worry about mosquito breeding. And so that's what I'm checking for when I'm looking at how quickly that water's gonna drain. So it's as simple as digging a hole as deep as what I'm gonna have for my rain garden, getting it good and saturated with water, and then filling it up and coming back and looking in a few hours to see how, how far has the water level dropped. That's essentially what I'm doing when I'm doing that kind of a percolation test. In the drainage area, uh, again, I'm, I'm looking often at, at my roof, so I'm directing a downspout uh, to, this, uh, to this area where I have the rain garden located, uh, or I have you know, just the normal drainage off of my driveway or something like that that I'm capturing as part of the rain garden. Uh, and normally I'm looking at a rain garden that's about 100 to 300 square feet. That's a pretty manageable size rain garden. Um, and that's typically uh, also considering my drainage area. So if I have uh, 1,000 square foot of drainage area and I'm looking at 3 to 15 percent of that, you can see it's going to put me in that range of 100 to 300 square feet. If I get much bigger than about 300 square feet, I normally want to split those up into multiple, um, multiple rain gardens. And there's also, if, you're on, if you like to get on Oklahoma Gardening, uh, there's a two-part uh, series on Oklahoma Gardening about uh, building a, uh, a rain garden. So you could uh, watch some of the videos on how they constructed that as well. As I mentioned, there are uh, some fact sheets. Uh, the one we've been talking about uh, today is uh, design of rainwater harvesting systems in Oklahoma. I have some of those here and uh, you can take those with you, so I'll, I'll set these up for you before you go. Uh, there is also another fact sheet that's just talking about stormwater runoff, so if you had some interest in learning more about uh, stormwater runoff and low impact development, uh, there's a good fact sheet there. And then uh, designing a rain garden for residential property. Um, if you go to uh, the web and just go to factsheets.okstate.edu, then you can search for any of these either by the number so BAE 1757, or you can search for a topic that you're interested in. So if you're looking at rain gardens, you, you could type that in and it would pull up any fact sheets related to that, to that topic. We are, um, we're essentially out of time here. I, I was gonna mention just briefly one of our student groups um, that, I'm, that I'm familiar with. Uh, there's a program called Engineers Without Borders and so Engineers Without Borders is kind of like Doctors Without Borders. Uh, you've probably heard about that before. Uh, but Engineers Without Borders goes into developing countries and tries to help uh, come up with engineered solutions to make the community's uh, lives a little bit better that they're working with. They partner with them for a minimum of five years. Uh, we've had a group that's been uh, active on OSU's campus going back I think to the early 2000s, but they've been working on a project uh, in Guatemala since 2015. And one of the projects that they did was actually rainwater harvesting. So it's, it's an interesting program. Um, th this community has a, a water supply that was causing a lot of health problems for the community. Um, they're, they're getting their water from a, from a stream essentially, but it was a, a stream that had a lot of pollutants and things like that in it. So dealing with that, education on why it's important to do things like hand washing, why you wanna watch um, you know, not putting waste products into your, uh, into your stream where you're gonna be getting your drinking water from, these types of things. Uh, so a lot of education going on as well. Um, but there's, uh, there's also a, a video, I, I won't show the video, but if you're, if you're interested in learning more about this, Engineers Without Borders, uh, OSU, if you, if you search that on YouTube. Great little video showing them uh, doing some of these activities uh, in Guatemala this last year. Uh, over the last two years, they've built, um, they've built a rainwater harvesting system. They've also uh, delivered like kitchen scale filtration systems to reduce the microbial load of the water that they're using in their home. So they're catching rainwater and they also have um, uh, treatment, you know, sort of on-site treatment to reduce the amount of microbial activity that they have in their water. So really great project. It's fun to see students get involved in making a difference in the world around them and applying some of the knowledge that they're learning in school.
All right, with that, thank you all for your attention and participation in our quizzes and all these things.